now directly move uh, into our next session, switching topic. Digital public goods are digital products, the software, data, and algorithms that drive them. That serves to educate us, help us thrive in our professional lives, enrich our cultural experiences, and ultimately do good for the benefit of humankind. The UN Secretary General have chosen Norway, Sierra Leone, ISPRIT and UNICEF to be so-called champions, to take lead in the work of implementing recommendations from the high-level panel on digital cooperation. And this includes both the establishment of the alliance, an alliance, and a platform for digital public goods. To help us dive into uh, the substance of this, we have put together quite a panel for you. Chris Fabian leads UNICEF Ventures, which invests in open source technologies of, for the public good. And he has served as an advisor to several of the UN Secretary Generals on frontier technologies like AI, data science, blockchain, and cryptocurrency. Aysa Tuba is from the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation in Sierra Leone, where she works closely with the president. And she heads the Global Partnerships for, DS, for DSTI. Tanush Buswani, works with sharing some of India's experiences and technologies with other countries, in particular technologies that can provide financial inclusion for the poor. To moderate this session, we have the experienced Liv Marte Nurhau, who heads Nurad's Digital Empowerment Project. Please welcome them all on stage. Thank you so much for the introduction, and it's great to be here together with the three co-champions that Norway has uh, in the implementation of this very exciting initiative. Chris, I thought I would start by asking you um, a question, given that we have been working very closely with UNICEF on the con conceptualization of this initiative. UNICEF has invested in open source and digital public goods for a long time. Why does it make sense now to develop an alliance and a platform around this concept of digital public goods? Thanks, Liv, and thank you, everybody. Good morning. Um, what an honor to be here with my other distinguished panelists and, and all of you in the room who've been contributing to this work over the last two years. The internet is broken. Um, if you look at the top 100 websites, 99 of them are commercial websites. There's one of them that provides sort of a digital public good, which is Wikipedia. Everything else is trying to sell you something. Uh, the internet is broken also. It's a terrible place. If the internet was a physical building, I would never let my children into it. It's, uh, so the, the statistics that came out of Addis yesterday, out of the Child Protection Conference, say that at any one moment on the internet, there are 700,000, uh, three quarters of a million people online, men online, hunting children for sex. And these are, these are men. These are mostly white, rich men because they have access to the full internet, hunting children online. So the internet is a broken place and it's a commercial place. And over the last, and that's the depressing part of our conversation, now we're gonna get to the, <laughs> the fun part, but it's an Oslo morning, so we can start that way. <laughs> our team and, and many of our collaborators have realized over the last few years, as we've, as we've been investing in companies that are doing amazing things with technology that aren't in Silicon Valley, are not in Geneva, are not in Tokyo, but are spread around the world, that the opportunities for the next 
phase of information and digitalization don't come from the people who built that broken internet. They come from people who are building a chatbot to help young girls figure out how to manage menstrual health in Brazil that's now scaled to six countries. Or the folks who are building drones to deliver vaccines and supplies in Malawi. These are people using technology at its front and foremost. They're not trying to build a poor version of the internet or a degraded version of those terrible 99 websites that we're all trying to avoid anyway. They're trying to build something new, something that empowers us and connects us to opportunity and choice. And that's what we've been talking about when we've been talking about digital public goods. We've been looking at how we can inspire and find programmers and business people around the world to build things that are relevant to humanity, but that can move us forward. And so we've been investing in small companies and startups and trying to give them the support through governments like Sierra Leone, through connections like the ones that iSpirit has in India, to give them access to the same things that come so easily if you're in Silicon Valley. And we'll talk a few, about a few examples today. But it's a pleasure to be here and to kick off this partnership with Norway. Thank you, Liv. Thank you, Chris. I start to... Yes. I understand that Sierra Leone has embarked on a very ambitious journey to really use technology as a driving force for the country's development. What role do you see for digital public goods as a part of this process in your country? Um, thank you, Liv, and good morning. Really happy to be here. Um, I must say, for reasons of neurodiversity, I'll be relying on my phone. I don't mean to be rude to the audience. Um, so I work at DSTI, and uh, that's the Directorate of Science, Technology, and Innovation in Sierra Leone. Um, the Directorate itself sits in the office of the President um, of the Republic of Sierra Leone and has a mandate to use science, technology, and innovation to drive the national development goals. Uh, DSTI itself has been alive for a little over a year, and uh, recently we launched our national innovation and dig digitization strategy. Um, it, the strategy itself is bigger than our implementation mandate, but um, going forward, everything that we do will be anchored within um, that strategy. Uh, I bring thanks all the way from Sierra Leone to the DPG Alliance. Uh, we should and we must recognize that um, members of the Alliance read and provided instructive comments uh, that we incorporated into the final uh, version of our strategy. So now that we have an, a strategy, what do we do? Uh, we are open to collaborate. Um, we, we want to play, <coughs> we want a space to play, and uh, we want to make choices within the Alliance storefront. Um, if, you, if you broadly sort of, our strategy has three, uh, our, our, strategy, our strategy has three areas to it. Uh, digital identity, digital economy, and digital governance. The tools um, in the Alliance itself are tools, we think, that would help us deliver on those three parts. Um, and the technology behind it, blockchain, IO, um, IoT, 3D printing, um, for IR in general, we think are essentially why the DPG exists. Sorry for using DPG as in digital public <laughs> goods. <laughs> That's why the Digital Public Goods um, Alliance exists. And some of these algorithms are open source and should be open source. Um, in fact, if you think about um, blockchain, Nigeria, um, the underlying infrastructure uh, around blockchain, um, and uh, if you're thinking about Hyperledger, uh, all blockchain technology really are, are open source, as are the solutions. So by definition, a few months ago, when Sierra Leone launched the Kiva e um, Know Your Citizen uh, solution, we were taking advantage of a digital public good, um, which is blockchain. And if you think about other um, sort of open source algorithms um, and machines for 3D, print, 3D printing, printing, for example, they fall in line with that. Um, in Sierra Leone, we're also implementing um, DHIS2, which is an openly licensed um, health information management system, and we're customizing different solutions um, around that platform. At DSTI, we've also built an IGIS portal. Uh, IGIS GIS stands for Integrated Geographic Information Systems. I will not go too much into it because a colleague of mine will be presenting um, on that portal later on in the session. But we've built that technology, um, and 
we've built our portal and the data and the technology that forms the portal, the algorithm sort of that links, that cleans and links data um, is a public good that is available to share. And we've shared this with multiple partners, including WHO, um, UNICEF, and the telecom companies in the private sector and in Sierra Leone. Um, same as the UNICEF drone corridor, we've established in Sierra Leone, um, the work that's coming out of that, the data that's coming out of that is a public good. Um, we've also built an education data hub. This one is slightly different. Uh, because the technology itself, um, the, the solution that, that we used to build that platform is not uh, open. It's not a public good in that sense, uh, because we did use a company, um, and this is another conversation, we did use a company to build parts of it, but um, the solution, ultimately, as we clean and we share data back, as we anonym anonymize it, the solutions is a public good. Um, so while the tech underneath the platform is not, the analysis is a public good. And we've opened that up. We do not have any um, special backdoor analysis that people cannot access. Uh, the results, in our opinion, equally matter um, as the tech that, that is behind sort of the results. On this point, we've also been working really closely with UNICEF on building um, appropriate uh, data science algorithms uh, that inform the backend analysis of that portal. Um, I will end by saying that really the hope for us, for Pathfinders and the DPG Alliance, uh, is that we can use uh, our role within the Alliance, that we can sort of use Sierra Leone as a space um, and a test bed uh, where we can work at scale. We're a small country, uh, but we do punch above our weight. You do, indeed. <laughs> And I think it's, it's useful to sum up what we heard here. We, hear, we both heard examples of reuse of existing technology. Uh, you will hear about DHIS2 later. It happens to be managed at the University of Oslo. Uh, I'm sure there could be also a non-Norwegian example in, in the stack, but uh, it's, uh, it's particularly interesting given that we'll have a presentation about that. But I also heard you mention that you are creating and sharing digital public goods that others can use. So just to demystify the concept about, it's about being able to build on what others have done and to share back what you're doing. It's in a way as simple as that. I would move, like to move to India. Tanush, your country has experienced an amazing, amazing journey of digital inclusion. And I know that you have actually been part of that journey working very closely with Nanda Nilekani, who even Bill Gates says that he deeply, deeply admires. Um, I would like to ask you to share some of the highlights of the digital inclusion journey in India with right. the audience today. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. The weather is very cold, but the people are very warm. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, in India, about 10 years ago, we came to the same realization that Chris mentioned that the internet is broken. Uh, we couldn't do with a world wide web. We needed an India's inclusive internet. And if you wanted to do that, uh, you know, we realized that in a country as big and diverse as India, you can't build a solution for everyone. You can't build a solution that works for everyone, and you really won't be able to reach everyone by yourself, which meant that we had to build infrastructure. The way the governments used to build infrastructure in the physical world, we said that's what we do in the digital world. And, and essentially, that infrastructure, we said, has to be a public good. It has to be something uh, that is context independent so that people in their context can build solutions on top of. Now, all this is, is yeah, what did we actually do? Right? And uh, we did three things uh, that I think were very important, were identity, payments, and how do we think about data. Those three things, if you do, you can recreate a, a new internet. On the identity space, we um, gave a digital ID, a number, not a card, because a card can get lost, a card can be kept by the men in the house controlling the women, you know, all the social problems. So a number that's linked to you, your biometrics, in 2009, uh, and in about four years, we reached 600 million people. In five and a half years, we reached a billion people. And today, we are at 1.23 billion, you know, going at the edge, covering the, uh, you know, the most hard to reach. Um, and 99% of the adult population, and about 15% of the world. 
So ID allows you to be seen, to be heard, to be present in, in the digital conversation. Next, we did payments. And for payments, we, um, you know, in a country of 1,300 million people, we have about 30, 35 million credit cards. People like me own two, three credit cards, so only about 20 million out of 1,300 million um, have credit cards. Sorry, India just has big numbers, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> is, is, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's a pittance, and cards were not the solution for India. Again, we said, hey, we need to think about it ourselves, and we, we built something called the Unified Payments Interface, and uh, in just three years, so cards have been around in India for 30 years, in three years, uh, we went, we are now double of what cards do in India. We've crossed one billion transactions a month, two months ago. Um, and, and this is, you know, people are using it for a roadside vendor uh, selling vegetables, coconut water, uh, etc. on the road. Uh, small value transactions, uh, 10 rupees, 20 rupees, that's 20 cents or so, um, is, is being transacted on the platform. And finally, data. You know, in, we are saying that in all of this, as you get digital, uh, this data is going to be generated. Um, the way you architect software is, is power. It decides who gets that data and therefore who gets the benefit of that data. And in India, we are adamant that the data belongs to the user. And we will um, not just enshrine this in our laws, in our regulations, but also in the technology itself and make sure that the data belongs to the user and they can access it. Thank you. And, and just to follow up um, a little bit on, on the last you said, have you seen, has this journey also inspired others? Oh, sorry. Yes. So, okay. uh, <laughs> I, um, so we are here today because a lot of countries, um, both developing and developed, want to take parts of these technology and these pieces. And the way we've built them as layers and modular things allows for this to happen. And therefore, while India never started in 2009 with the intent to take this outside, but now we are actively building them as public goods with open licenses so that people can take this outside. We have something called uh, MOSIP, and Vejanti is here for those who want to know more uh, about the modular open source identity project. Uh, for ID, uh, UPI, we are writing the protocols and we're going to publish them under an open license. You know, when we built this, we had no idea we want to take it abroad, but we're going to make changes to make sure that all of you can also access the technology, ideas, protocols, standards, code that we have in India. So there's an opportunity to adapt and yeah. build on the Indian experience. And many African countries in particular are have... asking for it. So uh, yeah. MOSIP is uh, Morocco and Philippines are uh, currently on the list. And many others are asking for it. UPI, similarly, there's interest from many countries. Not all of them I can name. Thank you. Chris, so now we heard of the government perspective, the Indian government developing technology that others can reuse. Can you say something about uh, and give us an example and of how UNICEF, a specific example of how UNICEF works when it sources and develops a digital public good? So I know I'm supposed to stay on script, but I'm not going to for like two minutes. <laughs> can, I, can everybody just raise both your hands, wiggle your fingers? That's just to get blood moving. OK, well, that feels good, doesn't it? I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a second. You put them down. Keep wiggling them. OK, Ooh, blood is moving. So quick question to the audience. If you had, so if you have, before you came into this room today, if you've heard of DHIS2 or DHIS2, raise your hand. OK, that's a bunch of health nerds and people who work in health systems. If you knew that India had a, a, a financial processing system that was doing more transactions per month than Visa? Amex. Amex. Whatever. <laughs> One of those. Raise your hand. India, OK, so fewer. <laughs> if you knew that Sierra Leone has a drone corridor where they're piloting drone technology that's more sophisticated than any other drone corridor in the, in the world, raise your hand. No, OK, two. So this, <laughs> this is the reason that we are forming an alliance for digital public goods. These are three examples of things that exist in the world that are sophisticated, using technology that don't, well, DHIS2, I think, needs to be renamed. It needs, a, it needs a more convincing name. I'll put that forward. Some of them have naming problems, uh, <laughs> but it's a wonderful platform. But there's an accessibility problem. We don't know that these things exist, but we do know that Facebook and Google and every, all these other big companies are there vying for our attention. And we've set up this alliance to create a space for both you to know about these things because they are important and because they can help you in your life 
if you want to fly drones or get in front of the next epidemic, but also because we can help find new programmers, developers, and business people around the world who want to build on top of these and inspire them with a little bit of money. We heard about the collaboration signed with Norway today, but with the support of all of us in this room. And that thing, that connectivity, that network never existed before. We're calling it the Digital Public Goods Alliance now. That also needs a new name. So if anybody's clever on naming, you can help us with, well, help us with that one first. Uh, but imagine a storefront for digital public goods where you walk in and you see these things just like you do in the shopping mall. And you can pull them off the shelf and understand what's been done with them and how they could be applied, but also how you can apply them and what sauce you can add to the pasta to make it taste right for you. That's the project that we're embarking on, and it's very exciting, but it's exciting because there's so much hidden below the waterline that we don't all know about. And so we're thrilled to be really kicking that off today, um, but looking for the next year for all of your help in expressing that. So I don't want to give, I was supposed to give my own examples, I'll just give other people's instead. Um, but <laughs> I hope that answers your question in an oblique roundabout way, and we'd love to invite all of you into this shopping mall with us. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to script Chris is like herding cats, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I think you actually gave a very, um, it was a very uh, compelling argument for why we're doing this. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to be angry with you for that. <laughs> but still, going back to you, Aisato. Yes. I will allow you to, uh, to follow what we have talked about earlier if you want. You can also go script. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask you a bit about the opportunity for a small country uh, with poverty challenges to shape your own future using technology? Um, absolutely. DSTI was crafted by the now president of the Republic and uh, Dr. David Senge, who heads DSTI, in a coffee shop um, and, uh, when the president was trying to be a president. And they, the vision for DSTI is centered on um, uh, sort of delivering, using science, tech, and innovation to deliver on, on, on our national development goals. Uh, today, DSDI itself is staffed by young people. The average age at DSDI is probably 30. Um, I'm one of the older people, probably the oldest person at DSDI. And uh, we're scientists, we're lawyers, we're technologists, we're researchers, we're public policy people, we're artists. But first and foremost, we're problem solvers. Um, we think uh, that technology and innovation sort of must be used to solve uh, the problems that we have in our, in, in, in our broader um, society to impact it. We're also future focused. Uh, more data has been created in the past two years um, than the entire human history. Uh, the, future f the future world for which we are creating solutions, we are not clear what that looks like, so we must really stay focused on the future. Um, being able to tap into digital public goods is key and extremely valuable for how we'll be able to do that. We do not have yet the full expertise or resources. Um, we need to compete at the level at which we'd like to deliver. Um, so we cannot develop everything from scratch. Um, we don't have that time, and we certainly cannot spend a lot of money buying proprietary um, technology. So yeah, that's, um, that's where we are. Recognizing this importance is a reason why Sierra Leone has been so deeply involved um, in, in this alliance um, so that we can sort of, we can work directly with Chris and with the alliance to make sure that the solutions that come out of it um, include and involve countries like ours. Thank you so much. And apologies, but our time is just up. There's so much to talk about here, but I would really like to thank you for coming to Norway for sharing this with us, and I hope that everyone takes the opportunity to look at the opportunities that this represents also for you. And thank you to other collaboration partners in the audience also.